Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another exciting ICPS webinar. My name is Kenny Coogan. I am the Education Director for ICPS, and today we have Chris Thorogood, all the way from England. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's a pleasure um, to be with you. Well, I was going to say this evening. I know for many of you, it's the morning. It's dark and cold here in, in Oxford. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, chasing plants, a very broad theme. Um, but I'd like to, to bring you some perspectives from, from a botanist and a career that I hold very dear to my heart and um, has spent a lot of it uh, around various parts of the globe um, chasing plants. But I join you today from Oxford, and I know this is an international audience, and I don't know how many of you have been to, um, to my city or, or, or visited, um, but we're in central England, and um, it's quite, quite a, a beautiful city in, in many ways, historic city. And um, my, um, well, may as well be my home <laughs> some weeks, but my office is in the um, Botanic Garden, which is what you're looking at there in, in the centre of Oxford. It's an old historic garden and I'm actually speaking to you from the bottom right hand corner, uh, just about five metres from the River Charwell, where we have the punters splashing their way along along the river during the summer months. And Oxford Botanic Garden is a, a small botanic garden, it's just a, a few acres in size, but it's a historic one. It was founded in 1621, so 401 years ago, um, by the Earl of Danby, who set aside a, a, a sum to um, to lease an area of land by the river and to build the, the land up specifically to grow medicinal plants to teach the university's medical students about how plants could be used in herbal medicine and so this is a garden that has uh, very much evolved um, over the course of four centuries with different political intellectual and social conditions so it has a very rich history and today we grow plants from all around the world as as all botanic gardens do um, and I have to say, since my arrival, we've we, we've acquired quite a lot of carnivorous plants, um, some of which I'll I'll talk about today. Um, but specifically, this talk is about my work as as a botanist um, and wearing my field botanist hat. Um, it takes me to all sorts of interesting places in pursuit of plants. Um, so that quick video there, this um, was when I was accompanying. Um, the Banao um, indigenous community in the Philippines, in Kalinga, which is a, a very remote wilderness in, in the north of Luzon Island, um, which is an area in many respects yet to be um, uh, well botanized um, and very difficult terrain, actually, um, in that sense. And just a week ago, I got back from Sumatra um, Island in Indonesia, which is a, an extraordinary and wonderful place to, to see plants. I was actually in search of, of not a, a carnivorous plant, but a parasitic plant, and, and they will also feature prominently in my, in my talk today. Um, I also have to, to warn you, if you've not got a head for heights that I have, <laughs> Um, I'm never happier actually than when I'm I'm on top of a um, a cliff looking at plants. So in my experience, um, plants tend to thrive where people don't, and so um, a lot of my time has been spent sort of going to really remote and in, inaccessible places, um, looking for plants to to support the research I do and the conservation work I do. Um, and so it does help sometimes if you if you have a good head um, for heights. Interestingly. Um, this isn't a slide that I normally put in, in a talk, um, but I thought given the audience, I, I would. Um, so I was a member of the um, our British Carnivorous Plant Society uh, back in when I was a kid in, in the 1990s. Um, and um, I scribbled these little illustrations and they used to feature in the in the journal, which um, I don't know about about this society, but it used to come as a as a photocopied stapled A4 pamphlet that came through the post um, a certain number of times per year. Um, I'm slightly showing my age now, I suppose. It's probably all digital now or, or, or um, printed in, in a fancy way. But nevertheless, this is how it was. And, and so I used to submit my drawings um, to that journal. And so this really shares a little bit some, uh, of something about me um, because um, as well as being a scientist, and scientists are driven by asking questions, you know, how does this work? Why is this plant the way it is, for example? Um, I'm also an, an artist and, and I always 
have drawn and scribbled and painted and that's how I make sense of the world around me and the whole talk that I'm going to give a give today themed around chasing plants um, is illustrated with with my own artwork um, that depicts some of the, the plants that I've seen around the world um, so um, I go on um, field expeditions um, and then when I come home, I, I sort of download, I suppose, the things that I've seen um, on, on canvas. So this is in particular is an erupting um, volcano in, in Japan, which I'll, um, um, was an, an experience of, of one field trip that, that, that I had. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so that's a little bit about me. I go around the world on, on various projects, looking at plants for different reasons, whether that's led by research or propagation or, or conservation, that sort of thing. And then when I come home, um, I like to download those experiences and make sense of them visually. And so I tend to have um, at any one time, lots and lots of photographs um, printed out around me like a big mood board. Um, and my studio is, a, is even though I'm pride myself on neatness in most compartments of my life. My studio is quite a messy place, um, a place of lots of creativity. Um, and this is just from a, an encounter with, with a plant in, in, in Greece. Um, and of course, um, Nepenthes villosa, which needs no introduction to, to you as an audience. Um, which will also feature in, in this in this talk today. So there's something about um, finding a plant in the wild that is is thrilling. I think it has a sort of um, gives you a sort of almost like an electric current. Um, so I've I've spent much of my life looking for um, wonderful plants. And there's a, a an almost indescribable sensation when you find a plant that you've been looking for, particularly somewhere really intrepid, and then you're surrounded by this natural beauty in this in this habitat, and you you see a plant, a striking work of nature. It sends a sort of jolt through you, like a, an electrical impulse, and I think it sort of imprints something on my brain, on my memory, and that's an an electrical current which I hold on to, and then later I I sort of download in 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 colour. Not all the plants are in in remarkable places, as as we'll see in in this talk. Um, I'm very lucky to have been to some incredible places, as I said, but I've also been um, to some some rather um, ordinary places to see extraordinary plants as well, which 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 I will explain. Um, I love painting Nepenthes pitcher plants. I I paint plants from all sorts of different groups, as as I'll explain in this talk. Um, but I am particularly fond of painting Nepenthes. And they draw me back to them again and again. Um, this is one that I finished just a, a few months ago, I think. Um, Nepenthes gracilliflora, um, based on a, inspired by an encounter I had with it in the Sierra Madre in the Philippines in, in March. Um, I remember um, vividly climbing through this very warm, wet forest and then it started raining. And you know, when it rains in the tropics, it means it. Um, so I was absolutely wet through hair plaster to my face and water trickling down me um, and then we entered this sort of crest like a, a sort of rocky ridge on top of a mossy forest and either side were these um, unfolding blue mountains sort of spooling out over the land um, and then next to me on, on either side in this thicket among the forked ferns were these um, vessel-like pitches of Nepenthes gracilliflora um, all dewy with with raindrops and so uh, when I painted it, I had to capture some of the essence of that experience. In this particular painting, I haven't included much of the background, um, but I wanted to bring the picture out to the foregrounds. And I also wanted those raindrops to tell a little something of the story of, of finding this plant. So for me, these paintings, they tell a, a story for me. And, and it's an experience that I go through recounting the experience in, in which I found these, these plants. Um, most of the paintings that I'll that I'll share in my talk today are oil paintings. The one that I just shared was indeed an oil painting. And for me, oils tend to capture a lifelike quality, a visceral quality, like you feel you could walk into the painting and touch something, which is which is what I, I seek to achieve. Um, but I also sometimes paint in watercolours as well. So these paintings um, of Nepenthes, obviously Nepenthes Nordiana and Nepenthes Raja, are both in done in, in watercolours. Um, it's not always my medium of choice, 
but watercolors enable you to get those really super fine details. And so when I paint one of these in watercolors, I get absolutely lost in a world of detail. Um, not always as therapeutic, perhaps, as it, as it might sound, because I, I can really... Um, uh, really punish myself in, in in detail so no detail is ever fine enough when you're painting a plant and in watercolors that can sometimes be quite a painstaking experience um, and then and I have to say when I get to the end of a painting it's it's almost a fallout of love process um, it it could it's at risk of, of sounding like some sort of false modesty oh well, you know I don't like it but actually that's true the the love goes into making the painting and then when it's done I've, I I no longer feel a need to to really engage with it and these are some some pitch plants on the left from the hills of Sarawak and on the right um, of course some of the beautiful specimens from Mount Kinabalu um, the hybrids um, um, the uh, Burbidgee Raja hybrid um, Alisupatrana Nepenthes Burbidgee um, upper and, and lower pitches there's something about the form the geometry of the pitcher plants of Mount Kinabalu as well as their colors that they draw me back again and again so I suppose I'll paint them for as for as long as I live. But on to our journey, I, I said that I was going to talk about chasing plants um, and, and I will. So um, you'll forgive me for diverging at times from strictly speaking about carnivorous plants. But in my experience, people who like carnivorous plants tend to like all things weird and wonderful, whether they be parasitic plants or aeroids and things like that. Um, so I, I hope you'll allow me in <laughs> to talk about some other things as, as well. And I wanted to start off with this one, which is sometimes known as a desert hyacinth. Its um, scientific name is Cystanchi deserticola. And this is a plant that, that I work on in, in my research. Um, so uh, another scientist and I and our PhD student and, and some collaborators internationally have been examining these plants for several years. So as you possibly know, as a parasitic plant, it steals its food from, in this case, the roots of other plants. So this is a, a desert um, dwelling plant and it has no leaves or chlorophyll or in fact roots of its own. And it steals its food from the roots of desert shrubs, which I've depicted in, in the background there. Um, and so we were interested in these plants initially because um, they've been used in traditional Chinese medicine and in medicine in other parts of the world for um, millennia, in fact. So it has a very long history of use. But we understand very little about where one species ends and another begins in plants like Sistanki. So they look very, very similar, the different species. Um, and remember, they don't have leaves. So for a botanist trying to differentiate plants, it can be quite difficult if you're bereft of key taxonomic characters. So plants like this, which have no leaves, it can be difficult to tell them apart and they all look quite similar. So we were interested in understanding what are the species limits in these plants. And that's really important because I mentioned that this plant is used in medicine. It's also um, traded around the world um, and if we as scientists don't understand the, the species limits among them, then we can't very well expect um, trade and customs to, to understand either. So it's very important that we distinguish these plants objectively. And to do that, we use the DNA. And um, when I um, used to do a lot of a lot more molecular work in DNA sequencing, it was um, it was a long and drawn out process. And now, thankfully, with advances in technology, you can actually extract and sequence DNA from herbarium specimens that might be hundreds of years old with with a level of reliability. Um, so so we're getting scientists are getting much better at understanding the 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 evolutionary relationships among these plants and which species are which. So that's one plant that keeps me busy. Um, here, of course, is, is another. So I, I told you I, I can't stop painting some of these plants. And so, <laughs> so I paint them again and again. Um, interestingly, Nepenthes burbidgii, its 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 common name, as you probably know, is, is sometimes called the painted pitcher plant. Um, so maybe that's why I keep on painting it. But it's an artist's dream, you know, with those those colours, the textures, the geometry of it, it has a very pleasing shape to it, that the, the curves the stripes, the splodges. Um, I can't get enough of, of this plant. 
and so for my book chasing plants which i i published quite recently with with q and the university of chicago press um i wanted to paint some of these plants and, and they feature quite quite prominently in 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 the book there um but they as besides um, painting them and growing them they're plants that also um, feature in my research as well so one project that, that i have examines um, the behavior of insects on the peristome, the, the stripy rim. And we're particularly interested in the physical properties of that peristome and how that leads insects to, to, fall, to fall in. So when I was a child and I used to marvel at pictures of, of pitcher plants in books, um, and books was all there was because, of course, we didn't have the internet then. Um, and I saw these fascinating plants and I read that insects slide off into a pool of liquid where they drown and they release nutrients for the plant, which we all know is, is well and good. Um, but we also know that it's a lot more complicated than that now. So we know, for example, that there are some pitcher plants that, um, that have evolved fascinating mutualistic relationships with animals. Uh, we know that the, the fluid inside some pitcher plants is viscoelastic, so it's sticky, which means that insects are, are sort of drawn back into the, the pitcher rather than um, being able to free themselves. Basically, the, the more we look at these plants, the more we find. Um, they really have a, a fascinating and, and beautiful biology to them. So my friends, um, physicists and, and engineers and mathematicians, um, the mathematically minded folk, uh, we, they were interested to understand more about the, um, the physics of the peristome and how things slide about. And to cut a quite a long story short, we put all sorts of things on the peristome, including droplets of oil that we stained. We looked at insects. And what we found was that the, the grooves, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, um, that make up the surface and, and give it a rough texture in one plane and smooth in another, those grooves, which are made up in turn of, of uh, another series of smaller grooves, um, they give the, the surface a, a set of characteristics which when you combine with a lubricating film of, of condensed water, it controls movement with a very high level of precision. So, for example, when we looked at oil droplets, tiny oil droplets, and how they travel along the surface of the peristome, what we found was that um, you can flip it upside down, you can move it about, and still these are, are guided in a way that is it goes well beyond arbitrary um, movement or random movement. It's very, very precise how things are controlled. Similarly with insects, they don't just slide about all over the place. They're driven into the trap in quite a tightly controlled way. And so for, for me as an evolutionary biologist, I was interested to understand this because it suggests that once again, these clever pitcher plants are not just sitting there waiting for prey to randomly slide about. They're driven in, in the, into the trap in a, in a way that is a little more finely controlled and less arbitrary than, than, than we might have guessed. And for my um, engineering um, friends, they were intrigued by this because they suggest this might have an application in a branch of technology called microfluidics, specifically something called slips, slippery liquids infused porous surface technology. And this has lots of applications in medical devices, in all sorts of things. The one that people often visualize well is inkjet printing, where you have to move small amounts of liquid around with high precision. So there's a lot we can learn even from carnivorous plants in technology. Now, on my journey around <laughs> chasing plants, um, I really wanted in, in, in the book that, that came out recently to, to highlight to people that lucky as I am to visit extraordinary places in search of plants, sometimes extraordinary plants grow in very ordinary places. And one of my early memories of being um, fascinated by plants was actually um, in the car park outside Ikea. Um, so I had read as a child about these unusual plants called brim rapes that we have in the UK, Orobanchi um, is their scientific name. Um, and you have um, relatives in the US as well, like beech drops and, and, and things like that. Parasitic plants once again. And I was interested in, in these plants because the books told me that this particular one called Orobanchi minor grows on lots and lots of different host plants, um, but it's particularly fond of red clovers. So when I found this plant as a teenager growing outside Ikea, I collected the seeds and I thought, great, I'm going to grow this. And so I planted the seeds on a potted red clover. 
nothing happened, nothing came up. And I couldn't understand what I'd done wrong. And so the following year, I went back and collected more seed and I looked at what the plant was that it was parasitizing. And it seems to be this garden shrub called a brachyglottis. And I, I don't know if, how widespread this is, but it originates in New Zealand, but it's commonly planted here in um, ornamental plantings outside you know, retail parks, things like that. And this time when I planted the Orobanki seed, my crop came up thick and fast like big purple asparaguses. And I was absolutely delighted. You know that thrill you get when, you, when you've grown something um, extraordinary and, um, and, it, and it thrives in your care. It's a sort of magical experience. I was so happy. But more than this, it taught me that these parasitic plants are choosier than we think than we thought. So the books tell us that species like this one can grow on lots of different things. But actually, my experiment showed me that even within a species, they're quite specific, they're quite choosy as to which hosts they'll grow on. And that really became the compass for my early research in which I was examining how brim rapes have adapted to grow on different species of host and how that might drive the evolution of new species. So if we imagine, for example, that this one tends to prefer brachyglottis in Ikea car parks, strange though that may be, that's quite a distinct ecology. It's quite different to, for example, clovers growing in wild fields. And it may be that the host's different ecologies have uh, created barriers between populations of these parasitic plants. And this is a catalyst for their speciation, the evolution of new species. So in other words, by jumping from one host to another, if that host has a different ecology, whether it's a woodland, a cliff, a field or a car park, that can be a template for, for driving populations apart and they become genetically distinct. And that means they're on the road to becoming new species, because we often think of species as, as something that's quite fixed. You know, this is one species, this is another, which, which is in many respects the case. But it's also a process and we're just looking at it as people at, at one snapshot in time, um, a process of, of, of evolution. And this is an example of, of what um, biologists call incipient speciation. So it's it's the, the separating of species right now and that they've not gone very far along that journey yet. So it's not very, not very apparent. This is one called Orobanchi picridis, which is um, a really rare um, species in, in the UK. There are only a couple of places in, in which it grows, um, one of which is on the White Cliffs of Dover. And I spent um, a hair raising afternoon in my early 20s um, scaling a, a cliff um, to get down to a rocky ledge where I could see this this lovely population of or Orobanchi was 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 growing. Um, and I still remember sitting on this little grassy ledge overlooking the sea and beneath me, I could hear the ferry terminus below with their shouting their security announcements and in instructions, because that's um, where the ferry goes from Dover to Calais in, in, in France. So another another sort of um, unusual experience, which probably wouldn't make it very well past a risk assessment these days. This one um, is a um, it's not a rare species, but it's a, a rare form of of a species, Orobanchi minor again. And this one I found growing in some in some docklands in in South Wales on a, a soaking wet day in June. Um, but when I did this painting, I really wanted to conjure some of the industry of the environment in, in which it grows. Um, so some of the plants I've found grow in remote misty mountain tops in Southeast Asia, but some of them grow in um, among the Coke cans um, in in less sort of glamorous places, I suppose. Um, this was one that I found growing on a on a cliff in Northern Ireland last June. It's called Orobanchi alba, thyme brim rape. Um, and I had to scrabble up this very steep black basalt cliff, quite an imposing place, very beautiful um, wild stretch of the coast of, of Northern Ireland um, and found this this very beautiful jewel like plant growing there. Um, these sort of red embers almost glowing against the black rock of the cliff. Um, um, and this is this is another example of one that, that I found. Um, but. I'm now going to take us from the IKEA car park south, um, specifically to, to South Africa, where a very peculiar plant grows. And someone someone wrote a, re a review of my book recently, and they described it as looking like a, a dissected um, melon, a cantaloupe melon, which I can, I can understand. Um, this is a really weird and extraordinary plant called Hidnora. 
and it grows um, across Africa and to an extent around the Arabian Peninsula as well. Um, and in my 20s, I, I, I was desperate to find this plant. And actually, it was very little known back then. And I remember talking to even other botanists about Hidnora and they um, no one had ever really heard of it, to be to be perfectly honest. But these days with with social media and instant communication and, and lots of plants that were little known then and becoming much more um, widely known. And um, together with my colleagues at Kew and Sheffield, we have a PhD student, Seb, who's busy working on these plants now. And it's it's lovely that a plant that I that I first saw many years ago um, is now uh, an, a, another point of, of, of research and, um, and evolutionary research and a point of inquiry. But anyway, this is a, a parasite that grows in the deserts and the semi-deserts, and it grows on succulent euphorbia shrubs. And it's a, an extraordinary thing. If you were to uproot it, which which I did with the relevant paperwork, um, it has these black, thick python-like underground stems. It again, it has no true roots, but a massive underground system of, of stems in which it stores a huge amount of starch. And then it punches its way up through the desert floor. Indeed, it can actually grow through tarmac. It's a really strong um, beast. Um, and it produces this, um, this flowering structure, which um, carnivorous it is not, but it does trap insects rather like a carnivorous plant does. But in this case, it traps them for um, for pollination purposes. The interesting thing about these parasitic plants is that unlike the carnivorous plants, they're not widely grown. They're actually very difficult. So we collected seed with permission from this plant in 2008, I think it was. And um, we've never succeeded in, in growing it yet um, for one reason or another. So some of these are very difficult to, to grow. I fancied that carnivorous plant enthusiasts might also like aeroids. Um, so I'm, in a minute, I'm going to show you, there's a reason I call this dragon slaying. But before I do, um, this is a, a picture of a, a very strange plant called Lathraea rhodopia which grows up in the Rhodopi mountains um, that, that straddle the border between Greece and Bulgaria. And a few years ago, I made an excursion to that part of the world. Um, it's not somewhere tourists go, actually. So Greece is, is a very beautiful country and lots of people go there for, for um, summer Mediterranean holidays. Um, but actually, I headed north to, uh, to, to the border with Bulgaria through wild and remote hills and um, places where, where no one spoke any any English um, and, and stayed in, in, in remote villages. And my destination was a particular forest where these strange plants grow parasitic on the roots of hazel trees. Um, so it's a kind of toothwort is, is what we call it. And we have toothworts growing wild here in the UK, but this is a um, a, a monster compared with the, the humble cousin that, that grows wild here and it grows up to your knee. And I'll never forget that moment um, in a dark um, forest in early spring, still quite cold, where these strange luminous um, plants lit up the forest rather like church candles. Um, uh, this is a, a sketch I did of, of Mount Olympus in Greece. Mount Olympus is a a wonderful place because it stands proud and in terms of topographic presence it's it's one of the largest and most important mountains in, in this part of the world it's huge um, and it's a real mixing pot for different elements of, of flora so you have a sort of pontic bridge to, to Turkey and, and further east you have Mediterranean elements Balkan elements and you have the alpines um, together with the lowland species that sort of um, grow at different altitudes and, and mix around the, the intersections. So you can sort of strike on a walk through a canyon and find all sorts of plants from, from different altitudes all growing mixed together at once. So it's a lovely place to, to see plants. Um, there are numerous species of orchid. A colleague of mine told me how many and um, it was in the tens and I can't remember exactly how many, but many, many species of orchid, wild irises. And there are one or two carnivores as well. So there, there's a colony of pinguiculas that grows around a particular waterfall. And I spent ages trying to find them and I just couldn't find them. So I don't know what I was what I was doing wrong. I was obviously in the wrong place. Um, but maybe one day I'll, I'll have the opportunity to return to this great mountain and see the pinguiculas there. These are some of the irises that grew at the foot of the mountain, Iris recombachii, um, which I 
I, you know, this is the home of Zeus, the god of storms, is it? And it seems quite apposite then that that I arrived um, amid a, a terrible one um, and got absolutely soaked. And just as the storm clouds sort of cleared for a while, I parked the car and 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 had a walk, looking for some orchids, in fact. But I also found the this lovely pair of of um, of irises. A, a particular. Um, pursuit uh, on that um, that mountain was was to find Ramonda Heldriki, sometimes still called Jankea Heldriki, which is a, a a rare point endemic. So it only grows on on the rocky slopes of this one mountain and, and nowhere else in the world. And it's sometimes described as a, a tertiary relic um, flora. So it's a it's a plant for which the closest ancestors grow much further east predominantly in, in the Himalayas. And so the ancestors of this plant probably um, became extinct long ago in the lowlands. And these mountains have acted as sort of refuges for, the, for these plants where they're sort of literally clinging on to, to their lives um, up in, in, in the mountains. And that's the wonderful thing about mountains and cliffs. And that's why I'm drawn to them again and again is that plants in lowland places are often being wiped out by, by human change, but, but up in the mountains, that's where you still find remnants of, of wilderness. Um, these possibly, um, need no introduction, but but just in case, these are bee orchids, um, orchids from the genus Ophrys. Extraordinary flowers that mimic um, both in appearance and smell uh, female insects, and therefore they lure male insects um, to them. The male insects think that they found a seductive female with which to mate. Um, and what actually happens is that as they are duped by the flowers in, in their investigations um, and whilst um, thrusting against the flowers in which in, the, in a process in the science biz is called pseudo copulation, um, they become saddled with the, the flowers pollen and then bewildered, they sort of buzz off. Um, and because, as I like to say, plants are sometimes smarter than insects, the chances are the insects will repeat the same thing all over again. And this time they'll deliver their cargo of pollen. And then, of course, they've brought about cross pollination um, for the plant. So, so, I mean, this is one of the wonderful things as we know about carnivorous plants that play tricks on insects. Um, plants again and again have really um, evolved to exploit uh, um, insects um, and other animals for, for their own benefit. And so, uh, you know, we often think of plants as being inanimate or still, and I think that's one of the reasons that people first get, um, get very fascinated by carnivorous plants and others is because they transform our perception of, of how plants behave and, and this notion that they're just sort of beautiful green ornaments um, uh, as, and a backdrop against which for animals to exist. Because actually, if you look in a little bit more detail or you're able to speed things up, there's a whole underworld to plants out there. Um, I mentioned dragon slaying a moment ago and um, aeroids in, in particular. So I love aeroids and I always have. And, and I wonder if some of our listeners may also, because in my experience, people tend to, who like carnivorous plants tend to like other weird things like these. Um, these are some Mediterranean aeroids that, that I spent some time painting that I encountered in, in Crete and Cyprus, beautiful islands in, in the Aegean, a sort of um, uh, blue sparkling sea, um, orange blossom, the, the soapy waft of orange blossom through the air, the, the sound of cicadas, really, really beautiful places. And that's a wonderful place in the spring to find these aeroids. Um, and in particular, the dragon aerum, which is the one on the right with the shiny blackish spadix there. Um, this is quite common now in, in gardens. It's very easy to grow. You grow it from a, a corm about the size of a tennis ball or a small football. Um, and then it produces these large inflorescences that, that famously smell very bad to attract pollinating flies. Um, and it's a plant that I've always grown ever since I was young and I'm very familiar with. But actually, it wasn't until a few years ago that I first saw it in the wild growing in, um, in the ravines of Crete. And honestly, it's a sight to behold. It's very arresting because 
um, it grows on these stunted wind beaten and sun beaten plains by the sea. Um, so sort of orange crumbly cliffs next to blue seawater. Um, and then these dragonarums stand like sentinels and they're very, very strong, and very sturdy. And they sort of rise up through the elements and produce these enormous inflorescences, regardless of what the weather throws at them. Um, and it's quite an empowering experience. And I remember um, one particular year, the spring had arrived late in Crete. And so I had to work harder to find these plants in flower. And so um, I ended up having to descend a cliff, um, which as you know, I've done before, <laughs> um, but nevertheless, always a tricky experience. And when I got to the bottom of this cliff, I found myself on this, another slope. And there was a whole herd, if you will, of dragonarums in full bloom with a, a really noxious and pungent smell. But really, the sight was was quite arresting. These are moments that you never forget, you know, um, all through life, um, life's rich tapestry. Things happen every day that 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 we just sort of um, push to one side in our brains. But moments with extraordinary plants in beautiful places are moments that, that are without compare and never forgotten. This is the, the Finnish plate of the, of the various um, aeroids of, of Crete, actually, not Cyprus, I remember. Um, here are the two from, from Cyprus. The one on the left, that was, that's Aerum rupicola. And this one grows on bouldery, loose slopes. So you kind of have to abseil down a, down a slope to, to find that one. Um, a few more irises. I will return to some carnivores um, shortly. Um, Israel, Palestine and other parts of the Middle East, these are the places in, in my view to see some of the finest irises in the world. This one is growing in the upper Galilee in northern Israel. This is Iris Bismarckiana and my good friend and scientist Yuval Sapir took me um, to this special place where this iris grows. And isn't it mesmerizing? Um, I mean, it's it's its flowers are, are without compare. And actually, it made me wonder why for years we've sort of bred all sorts of um, blousy, showy irises when actually some of the wild ones are, um, in my view, are, are just exquisite and, and um, um, beyond improvement, actually. Um, but it has these these standard petals which have a slight lead grey sort of tint to them and then the fall petals with these very intricate markings. Um, very, very beautiful. We then went up to the Golan Heights, um, which is an area that's quite remote and, um, and obviously um, politically well, well known, um, but um, for our reasons for visiting were, were botanical. And this is where um, Iris atrophisca grows with its um, beautiful dark flowers, which snatch the light in a way that other plants don't. Um, there's something about a black flower that when the light catches it, it catches elements of sky and sun and, and sea and land. Um, a really, really striking plant, which I've never seen in cultivation. I've only ever seen this in, in the wild. And here is Sistanki again, the, um, another species of the one that I mentioned earlier that, that I work on. And these were growing all up and down the, the deserts there. And this is an another one which uh, we're currently unsure as to whether it's a new species that we've encountered or whether it's an existing species that was never recorded in the area. It's probably new. Um, we're currently doing the DNA sequencing at, at the moment to, to understand that. Um, and, you know, all of these pursuits are, are not without their, their perils. Um, on the left there, that's down on, on the border um, with Sinai, um, where um, people get a little bit edgy if you poke about the borders, I've discovered. Um, but that's where we found Paracarium, that strange plant with the balloon-like fruits. And then on the right is a, a rare allium called Allium sinaiticum. And my friends there told me that this had not flowered in this part for 20 years because the rain falls in different places around the desert. Um, as it does in all deserts. Um, and in this particular place, there was an unusual proliferation of these alliums. Um, but I um, literally nearly slammed the passenger door into the danger of mine sign as we got out the car. This is another aeroid from Israel. This is Aminium spiculatum, um, which to my mind, it reminded me a little bit of a stake, kind of rare around the edges and well done in the middle. And this was the last iris that, that we saw on, on that particular trip, which is Iris Marie. Um, and I remember seeing that um, as the sun went down in the desert and um, the, the land was like sort of copper foil, sort of catching this, this beautiful soft light as our, as our shadows extended. And then there was this beautiful iris there on, on the horizon. 
Now to the Canary Islands, where I spend a lot of time. I'm currently working on a field guide with Kew Gardens. Um, so that takes me to the Canary Islands um, every so often. So I'm on my second visit of this year um, next week. Um, another place of um, precipitous cliffs and crags and wonderful succulents like these. So that one on the right, which looks for all the world like a cactus, is not a cactus, it's Euphorbia handiensis. Um, and actually it's known locally as a cactus, but, but cacti grow in the Americas. They don't grow in um, um, Africa in the Canary Islands. Um, these are, are spurges, Euphorbias, that, that under the same selection pressures, i.e. drought, have evolved to look uncannily like a, like a cactus. But this one on the right is very rare. It just grows on a couple of volcanic slopes um on that one one island in the world and i joined my colleague alfredo who like me has a head for heights and took me down um some very precipitous um cliffs um and we also do some conservation work there as well so i work with my friend matthias a local ecologist clearing invasive weeds which is what this picture is shows um, I'm mindful of, of the time, so I'm going to take us rapidly across kingdoms through Japan um, and to another parasite. This is um, Phasalanthus tuberfloris. This is a really rare parasite which I'd never seen before and my colleagues in Hokkaido um, took us to the very depths of a, of a remote forest in the Daisetsu Zan. And um, I remember him leading us through the strange parasol-like leaves of a, of a Petasites through to this sort of dark um, wilderness in, in the forest, a claustrophobic damp place. And there at, at our feet were these little fascicles of white flowers. And this is Phasalanthus. It grows on Actinidia, um, a, a, a sort of vine, and produces these little clusters of, of white flowers. Very strange plant. Um, this was my host there taking us through swamps and my goodness i've never seen horse flies like i did in hokkaido the size of cockroaches they really were this is again in, in the dicet suzanne and this is some of our survey work on the bonnet of, of a car a sort of pop-up herbarium if you will so some of our work seeks to understand what is the diversity of plants in, in a given habitat and how might we use that data to inform conservation priorities in short if we don't know what exists we can't conserve it adequately and so a lot of my work is spent understanding not just what where different species lie in in the spectrum of of taxonomy but also how many different species and what are they make up a, a whole community of plants and, and what might that mean for conservation gosh we got taken up mount tateyama in honshu in japan um, in june which effectively was spring because it was still snow melt um, these great walls of snow that are tunneled through and, and so we, we we passed those and i remember being taken out onto this crag um, where there were um, magnolias, magnolia um, salicifolia, if I'm not mistaken, this one with white sash like flowers on the branches, um, and wigelia and rhododendron, sort of dollops of strawberry and raspberry pink, and then beyond us, an enormous waterfall tumbling down a mountain. Um, just such an extraordinarily beautiful sight. Um, on the right is a wild wisteria because my goodness they grow in their natural habitat they grow quite differently to, to a wisteria in um, um, at least in British gardens anyway they sort of climb through the trees like pythons and you never actually see or very rarely the, the canopy because they grow right up into, into the forest. Um, these are some some plants that we that I painted that we collected for, for the Oxford herbaria. Um, I was interested to see a wild epimedium another orobanki on the, the banks of the river Jinsu with my friends um, who kindly gave up their Saturday morning to come and meet me. We'd celebrated um, a night of successful survey work that, um, the, the night before um, and the, the Japanese I've learned like a good celebration. Um, so suffice it to say I had a sore head that morning um, down on the banks of the river Jinsu in the stifling heat looking for parasitic plants. I also got taken to this wonderful festival in which lanterns called wishes are lit and sent along the river um, and as the night falls a river of stars forms um, along the, the banks of, of, of the river Jinsu so 
very, very beautiful place. This was an extraordinary character who I met, but there isn't time for me to, to tell her story, but I've written it in the book. And these are some of the wild arasimas that we found down in Kochi. So my work in Japan has taken me from the, the across the whole length of Japan, from right from Hokkaido in the north down to uh, the Ryukyu Islands in, in the south. And it really does have an astonishingly rich flora. These are some very beautiful jack-in-the-pulpit arasimas that, that we found in the mountains there. And that was just a tropical starfish. And so um, it's only right <laughs> that for the International Parasitic Carnivorous Plant Society, excuse me, that I that I return to my pitcher plants. And in some ways, this close to my talk is as much a um, a beginning as, as an ending, because this is a story of, of a boy who used to dream about visiting the land of the pitcher plants in Southeast Asia. This is Mount Kinabalu in North Borneo, and in some ways it's the capital of, of pitcher plants. And I dreamt of, of climbing this mountain as a, as a child. There's a botanist called Edred Corner who describes this mountain as having the most remarkable assemblages of plants in the world. Um, and, and really, I, I agree in, in, in many respects. It's a, an extraordinary place. Um, obviously, it's its topographic presence, its size, its altitude, the mixture of, of different temperature ranges from altitude, the geology of it, the, the rich um, geology, the serpentine rock, um, and the unstable environment. So lots of landslips over time, creating changing environments and habitats. A whole suite of different conditions has led to a um, to a crucible for the evolution of an extraordinary flora, one quite without compare. Um, and I've mentioned throughout this talk that that I'm drawn to some of these plants again and again, um, particularly the pitcher plants of Mount Kinabalu, which is where all the giant um, and very beautiful plants occur. And so I remember climbing this mountain, uh, summiting in fact twice in one week, um, because I just couldn't get enough of this place and I wanted to see every square inch, every leafy inch of this mountain and its surrounding peaks in the time that I spent there during my my early 20s. Um, and I scribbled the plants that I saw and I, I remembered. And then over the last, over recent decades, I've re again and again returned to my studio and painted them. Here my, this is a painting I did, but my the photo I took on my phone of it hasn't come out too well because of the flash. Um, but I really wanted to capture some of the impenetrable, but also the, the rich nature of the, the vegetation in which this um, Nepenthes kinabaluensis, that wild hybrid, grows in. Um, and this one grows in quite chilly conditions. I remember having a woolly hat on in the sort of cold, wet, um, rather like a, a sort of um, cold autumn crisp day here in the UK might feel like um, to find this pitcher plant growing in a in a muddy um, thicket um, down from the summit slope. And this is, of course, the, the king of them all, the Raja. Um, and, you know, as botanists, we're often asked, oh, what's your favourite plant? And I don't have one in reality, but, but if I did, um, I might be tempted to, to suggest that it was this. Um, the most magnificent of all the pitcher plants. And again, there's something about its geometry, isn't there? That sort of upright reflex lid, the big oblique mouth and the bucket-like shape, as well as its proportions, um, that, that for me, this plant will always hold a special place in, in my heart. And I remember seeing it for the first time um, on the eastern shoulder of Mount Kinabalu, growing among giant sedges, ferns and, and willowy trees. Um, and and that's where this this pitcher plant throws out its enormous pitchers all over pl the place, um, festooning the mossy rock and draping itself over um, shrubs and thickets. Um, and so, yes, I think it's a, a, a magnificent plant and quite widespread in, in collections now as well, of course. Um, but rivaling it in beauty is, is, as I've said many times already, the painted pitcher plant. Um, with its ethereal ghost-like pitches that really illuminate the dark mossy forests again around the eastern parts of, of Mount Kinabalu. This is, um, as you possibly know, again, Nepenthes um, Alyssa Putrana, the hybrid between Nepenthes Raja and Nepenthes Berbigi. Hard to know, isn't it, if it if it sort of exceeds both its parents and has the best attributes of both, or if it doesn't quite make it um, and both the parents um, su surpass its beauty or maybe I like all three equally I'm, I'm not sure but again there's something about it that that I do return to and, and paint 
Um, it wasn't an easy ascent for me, I have to say. Kinabalu is not the hardest of mountains to conquer on um, on the world stage. It's it's pretty accessible, to be honest. Um, but to do it twice in, in one week was a little gruelling. And then on one of the ascents, there was a typhoon at the top, which made it altogether a, um, a slightly less um, relaxing affair. And this was one of the orchids that I found on the Musilau Trail, which is a trail that I understand is now closed because of an earthquake and a landslip, which which renders the path now inaccessible. So I don't know if that will ever open again. Um, but but on that path were some beautiful orchids like this one, Area Robusta. Um, and among the orchids, the, the um, pitch plants, I found the finest um, Nepenthes villosa that, that I ever did um, along that trail growing um, a few feet above my head with these big jar like pitches hanging um, and it has these woody pitches that su long survive the, the parent um, plant or the, or the other pitches so you often find dead and, and living ones side by side and then down in the sweltering lowland forests are giant um, amorphophallus um, lamiae I think um, growing down near pouring um, and then a giant of course rafflesia and if you're lucky enough to find one in flower, um, they, they grow around the forests of, of, of Pouring um, as well. I'd like to end with this um, picture, this painting I did of Nepenthes villosa on Mount Kinabalu. So, so I mentioned this great mountain being sort of as much a beginning as an ending for me. And when I wrote the book Chasing Plants, I'd already written it and I'd done all the illustrations and something didn't sit right, something was incomplete. And I um, thought about it long and hard during sleepless nights and I realised that there was one more painting that I that I had to do that I hadn't done um, and 16 years after I stood on this mossy hillside it was like it was yesterday I could still remember everything about it every branch every leaf every bit of moss um, and over the course of three months which is how long this painting took me it was a very painstaking painting um, every brush stroke took me back to that mountainside is a very transportive process um, and I could remember exactly where I was standing, what I was thinking and what I was doing. Um, and then finally, after three months of painting and looking at this painting evolve as I was cleaning my teeth at night, um, I finished it and that's where, I, where the book for me had, had ended. And so for me, that was a sort of the, the closing of, of, of a chapter. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. You're welcome. All right. So we have several. Uh, we have more ICPS members than I anticipated. So it, that's great. And uh, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about the International Carnivorous Plant Society. And when I do that, I encourage more people to type into the chat box some questions for Chris. Our website is carnivorousplants.org. You can uh, access a lot of great information there. Growing guides uh, are often the most popular thing that are downloaded and read. Um, what's exciting is that we are going to be having our 13th international conference. We haven't had a conference in about four years. And in 2023, our conference will be taking place in Japan. And we hope Chris can join us or at least I hope Chris can tell me all of his contacts <laughs> in Japan. The 13th uh, ICPS conference is hosted by multiple carnivorous plant societies in Japan. To learn more about the conference and these societies, you can go to our website, which is carnivorousplants.org, and then go to the conference tab, or you can go to the uh, Japanese link what we found is that our social media does not like to share their link. So if you go to our website, we uh, have the link there with all the same information. Our conference is going to be taking, most of it is going to be near the Himeji Castle. We're gonna be there for several days and then one field trip, the last day, the field trip is uh, up north of uh, Tokyo. The couple of days where we have the conference, we have plant exhibitions from all four societies and then a couple of the botanical gardens. Plants will be available for sale. CITES permits will not be available. So you, if you wanna purchase stuff, you're gonna to have to get your CITES 
uh, certificates before the conference. Then we have a couple of uh, field trips, which we're very excited about. Here are some of the photos of what you can expect if you attend our conference. We have a great banquet hall. We have a great uh, presentation rooms. All of the presentations will be translated into Japanese and English. We're going to be attending uh, a couple. The field trips include a couple of botanical gardens, one of which just won a Guinness World Record for the largest Nepenthes in 2022. Wow, which one was that, Kenny? I think it was Truncada. Because because um, I saw in Toyama Botanic Garden um, an enormous Nepenthes truncata, and I just wondered. They're obviously very good in Japan at growing Nepenthes truncata, but maybe <laughs> it's maybe it's one and the same. But I can recommend the Nepenthes in Toyama Botanic Garden. What about this one, Hyogo uh, Prefecture Flower Center? Did you ever go there? I did not go there so maybe I should try and arrange to join you <laughs> okay very good because this is the one that I believe is only like a short bus ride or maybe even walking distance from the conference so that's like an easy field trip to add on to um here's another location actually this location might be the people who won the uh world the wow. Guinness Book of World Record and then, of course, we're excited to do field trips. We're going to see, of course, native plants, and then they have uh, many carnivorous plants from around the world. And then the very last day we're going to be is a big field trip where you're going to have to take that bullet train where we can see some beautiful uh, native pinguiculas. If you're interested in attending the conference, and I really hope you are because I'm excited to travel for the first time in about three years, the most important date for you to remember is March 31st. That's when the registration for the conference ends, but it also is when the banquet registration ends and all of those three field trips that we were talking about. If you want to present a 30 minute uh, presentation at this conference, you get to attend the conference for free. And remember it's gonna be in PowerPoint and all of the speeches are going to be translated into Japanese or English. Just today, we started a little uh, discount. If you go to our Teespring website, you can order t-shirts, mugs, tote bags, uh, notebooks, stickers, and they ship worldwide. All of the proceeds benefit our education and conservation funds. And from now until December 24th, you can enter WCPD, World's Carnivorous Plant Day 23, and you can get 10% off. And all of these things come in many colors and many uh, sizes. Now, the one reason, hopefully, why you want to support ICPS is through our education and conservation efforts. So these animated uh, videos do require some money. So that's why we're doing a little bit of fundraising. And then of course, we are a society that needs to be sending out those beautiful uh, newsletters like Chris was mentioning. I'm gonna show you one just in a minute. They're full colored, beautiful photos. And um, we hope you support the ICPS. Another thing to keep in mind is that the first Wednesday of May, Every year is World's Carnivorous Plant Day. Last year, it was on the 4th of May, 2022. But all of those videos, about 27 videos, are archived on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. So you can access all of this great free content through our channels. Another part of World's Carnivorous Plant Day is our annual photo contest. Everyone can enter. You do not need to be a member of ICPS and everyone can enter up to five photos. The contest is happening now through April uh, 14th. And if you are one of the three winners, you will receive a one-year membership to ICPS. And you can learn more about World Carnivorous Plant Day by going to our website and then clicking the About tab and then doing the drop-down menu. Another reason hopefully you want to support ICPS is because we offer carnivores and the classroom grants. Every year for two or three years now, we've been offering $150 grants worldwide to all the continents for teachers to add carnivorous plants into their classroom. So if you think that's a worthy endeavor, if you think kids should be 
exposed to carnivorous plants, growing them in their classroom, you can go to our Teespring. You can buy hats and t-shirts and mugs, and that money will help support carnivores in the classroom. Or you can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate and just directly donate to our cause. And I want everyone to write this down as well. This year, May 3rd, 2023, will be our third annual World's Carnivorous Plant Day. So we hope you participate in that. And the way you would participate in that is you could create a video. You could go to our Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, watch the videos, share the videos. You could also reach out to me and tell me a topic that you're interested in. And I will try to get a speaker. The speakers are scientists, conservationists, and botanical gardens from around the world. All right. And with that little ad, thank you, everyone, for being patient. We have a couple of questions and comments. Jane says, um, Chris, all of your uh, paintings are lovely. Your illustrations are stunning. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right. David says, excellent. Thank you. And then we have a couple more questions. What is, Chris, can you remind people, what is your position at Oxford and is painting part of your job description? <laughs> it's not really. So I'm my official position is the deputy director and the head of science at the Botanic Garden and Arboretum. Um, and I have a teaching position. Um, so I teach undergraduate and postgraduate biology at the university um, and arts though I might like it to be in my official job description is, is not. However, it, it art and science go hand in hand to an extent. And so um, so I judge the Flora Legium, which is the, the, um, the, the group of botanical artists here at, at Oxford. And I teach um, botanical watercolor and, and classes as, as well. So, so informally, I think we can say it's part of my job. <laughs> Very good. I think uh, a month ago, in addition to webinars, we the ICPS has monthly happy hours. And last uh, month we had Alistair Robinson. Oh yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. And he, just like you, is equally fascinated by illustrating plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well sure. as finding them out in the wild. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Is it possible for you to tell us how long it takes to paint a pitcher plant? <laughs> yeah. It it, um, it really does depend. So if you remember the one with the black background on the raindrops that I did at the, uh, showed at the beginning, that one was really quick. And I did that most of that in a weekend, quite honestly, it, it didn't take long because there wasn't an awful lot of detail. And then the one, the very last one I showed with Nepenthes Velosa on a mossy mountainside, that one took three months and was a painstaking process because a huge amount of detail. So, so really it depends on, on how much detail there is, how much I put in the background and, and, and that sort of thing. So, so it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string, but the other thing is that oil paintings take a long time to dry and you do glazes, you do layers. So sometimes I have to wait a week for a, a layer to dry. Whereas with a watercolor, it dries within minutes. So you can, you know, you can work on it all weekend and you'd make a lot of progress. How do you get these large paintings into your book? Are they all photos of the paintings or can you scan them somehow? Yeah, so so I I, I drive them all to Kew Gardens in the back of my car, which is an, an effort. <laughs> and then they, they, they do these big professional scans, which are these huge resolution files. And then um, the thing is, I'm really fussy because I know exactly what the colours were. And then the scan, sometimes the lighting they use changes um, changes the colours. So so for me, I can see looking at them that the colours aren't quite true to the original paintings, but, but maybe that's just my eyes. <laughs> I was going to ask you, how close is Oxford to Kew or how close is your house to Kew? Because I yeah. have visited there and I enjoy their carnivorous plant collection. Oh, well, you'd be very welcome to visit Oxford because it's not far. So um, we're, we're about in just a little over an hour on the train to London. And then obviously, as you know, Kew is, is a little bit of a trek because it's the other side of London. So so really, you can do the whole thing between in sort of two out a couple of hours. It's not far. All right. And I believe the last question is, what happens to the large paintings? <laughs> yeah, various destinations. So um so once in a while I, I sell them. So I sold the big one of the Nepenthes Velosa. Um most of the time uh, sometimes I exhibit. Um 
there's quite a lot of effort and actual and cost actually in exhibiting because you have to get everything framed and you have to transport it and curate it and all this kind of thing. So so it's it's not without its 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 cost for the artist. That's the thing. Um, and so some some of them sit in piles in my office and in my home, <laughs> stacked against walls and get generally getting in the way. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Very one day because sometimes people ask me if i've got prints and i haven't got any prints and i have looked into it and one day i will get myself a website set up and i will have prints printed and i will i will sell them that way but um i every spare hour i have i spend on doing the actual artwork rather than the administrative things which i which i'm a bit lazy with to be honest kenny <laughs> all right so whoever asked that there's still hope that you can get a copy of one of chris's paintings <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Chris. We always enjoy My you pleasure. participating with ICPS. And we hope to uh, see all everyone real soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Kenny. Bye. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.